Hello, Creekside. Today we're going to begin a new sermon series, and it feels very strange to be doing that in this format. I want so much to be with you and to celebrate with you and to do something together with you, and yet we're still isolated and cut off from each other. And that's why we chose the book to go through that we're going to go through, and that's Philippians. Philippians, for a lot of us, is a very familiar book. It's a favorite for many Christians. It is for me. Um, But what is unique about Philippians is it is written in a context of suffering. It is Paul, this pastoral figure who himself is suffering, writing to this church in Philippi that is experiencing suffering. And so the entire context is we're in pain, we're hurting. What does it mean for us in the face of suffering, in the midst of that, to live lives of joy? So Paul, as he's writing this, Paul is this great pastoral figure. He's writing it. He himself is in prison because of what he's boldly done for the gospel. He himself is in prison. He is suffering. He's writing to this church in Philippi. Now, the Christians there in Philippi, Philippi is a city. It was a Greek city actually named for Alexander the Great's father, Philip of Macedon. It's always been an important city. Um, And then the Roman Empire, when they come to power, take over this city. And it was a key uh, place in the battles that, that Rome won. And so they, the citizens of Rome, the, the people that lived in Philippi, were given this Roman citizenship as a reward for their aid in these battles. Now, this was a massive deal back then. To be a Roman citizen was a huge benefit. It, it involved status and privilege. And so the, the citizens of Philippi were thrilled about their citizenship as part of the Roman Empire. Now, what that included back then, if you were going to be a good Roman citizen, you had to be loyal, pledge your allegiance to your country, and pledge your allegiance to your emperor. And that included making offerings of sacrifice to the goddess Roma and also to the emperor, who was claimed to be divine. So Caesar, the leader of this Roman Empire, would use titles like Lord, uh, use titles like Savior. And it's in the midst of this setting that the Christians, the members of the early church, would look and they would say, I can't do that. I can't live fully. I can't pledge my allegiance to a society, to a, to a country or to a king other than Jesus. He is my Lord. And Paul, in writing the letter to the Philippians, talks a lot about, he talks about citizenship, that we have citizenship not in our earthly place, but in heaven. So we're living as citizens of a different country. But he uses also in the midst of this, the word Lord more times than he does in any of his other letters which is significant. Caesar, you could reach into your pocket and pull out a coin that would say that Caesar is Lord. And Paul and the early Christians were claiming, no, Jesus is Lord. Um, the, the, the emperor was known as the savior of the people. And yet Paul in, in Romans will talk about how Jesus is savior. And, and so there's this conflict inherent. And this is where opposition then comes from. There's people opposing the Christians for being Christians, calling them to loyalty to a country rather than to loyalty to Jesus, and they're not willing to do it. And so they're suffering on behalf of that. And so Paul writes, in prison for the gospel, to people who are suffering for holding firm to Christ and saying, this is what it looks like to live in the midst of suffering. We don't mope. We don't go around sad. We don't just allow ourselves to be burdened like this. We have a higher citizenship, and it brings with it all of this joy because of the gospel, because of who Jesus actually is. See, suffering is tricky, and and this is where we're at right now. This is a season of suffering for all of us. Now, I'll be the first to say I actually have it pretty easy. Like, I don't think I've been suffering that much. It it has been rough for sure, and and I I am in contact with so many of you that are suffering in different ways, financially, um, health-wise, in terms of loved ones that you've lost. That There is actually a lot of grief and suffering and heaviness right now. And it's so hard for us to live in a time like this. And words like joy can seem so trite or so inappropriate for a time like this. But I'm telling you, we're going to look at the book of Philippians because it pulls us back to the actual source of our joy. Paul Tripp has this great book on suffering. And one of the things he says is that suffering is this great disillusioning thing. It it disillusions us of the notion that we have control over our lives. So when suffering comes, none of us wants to suffer, right? So something has gone wrong. We've experienced suffering. It shows us we're not actually in control. And then here's what happens. As we experience suffering, there's there's two elements to the suffering that we experience. 
Number one is we suffer like the suffering itself, the things that are happening to us, we suffer on that account. But there's another side to it also that Paul Tripp points out, and it's this. We suffer from the circumstances, the actual suffering. We also suffer from what we ourselves in our hearts carry into the suffering with us. There's all kinds of wrong assumptions that we make. There's all kinds of ways that we misrelate to God or to the people around us. And all of those sometimes sit beneath the surface. But when we enter suffering, that, that thing, that, those, those assumptions and those realities that we bring in our hearts into the suffering with us will either make our suffering more difficult or they will make our suffering seem insignificant. And Paul writes to just address all of this. He's trying to show us what it looks like to cling to Jesus in the midst of a season of suffering. And that will mean experiencing joy. And so we're going to look at that. I'm going to do the first few verses here. Paul writes, and as he goes through, he says this at the beginning. Paul and Timothy, he's writing together with Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons. So Paul is writing to them, and it's him, Paul. He is a servant of Jesus, a slave of Jesus. It's interesting that, that, you know, Jesus didn't actually make Paul's life better in a sense. Paul was on the rise. He was a religious leader. He was being mentored in the system. He was kind of up and coming with upward mobility. And then Jesus appears to him on the road to Damascus. And suddenly his life looks like demotion and it looks like suffering and he's being beaten. He's being imprisoned and he's, he's traveling around. He doesn't have much money. People are supplying for his needs. His life did not look better because he gave his life to Jesus. But he says, I am a servant of Jesus. And I love this too, because Paul's writing, he is a apostle. And, and in most of his letters, he'll talk, Paul, an apostle of Jesus, and he'll give them instructions to help them sort out their stuff. In this letter, he's suffering, they're suffering. He comes to them and says, not I'm an apostle and I'm going to tell you what to do, but I'm a servant of Jesus. And I'm just writing to all these saints that are here. And we're on the same level. This is a love letter of friendship. Paul uses very little doctrinal argumentation in the book of Philippians. There's plenty of theology in it, but he's not arguing like he does in, in Romans that we dug into and, and were so blessed by a while back. He is leaning into this theology in the most practical sense to help people sort through and to cling to the joy of the gospel in the midst of a tough situation. This is what we need so much. And we need this reminder as he says, he's writing to the saints who are in Christ Jesus. So Paul is just a servant of Jesus. He's writing to these saints. It's the people that have been made holy in Jesus. This is their identity. It's who they actually are. It's who they truly are in Christ. They've been joined to Jesus, made holy. And, and so in the midst of our suffering, as he writes to these people that are suffering, he's reminding them, you're saints in Jesus. And what he offers to them, what he calls them to is in verse two, grace to you and peace from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What he wishes for them, what he wants them to experience is the grace that comes from Jesus and the peace that flows through all that. Man, I want that for all of us so much as we just lean into Jesus and to who he is and what we find. And you know, he's writing to, the, the other thing he says here, he writes to all the saints. I just think that is encouraging to me right now. As we are separated, I think there's a tendency for some of us to feel left behind a little bit, like we're, we've been left out. Um, there's some people that are doing okay. There's some people that seem to be connected, but here I am all, all by myself. And I feel like I'm on the sidelines. Paul writes to all the saints. You're not overlooked. You're not excluded. We are saints in Jesus, his grace, his peace flow to us. And so here's what Paul will say in the beginning here. Verse three, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I love this. Paul is suffering in prison. He's hurting, writing to people who are suffering. And he's saying, I thank my God every time I remember you. He has this heart that is thankful, this heart that's overflowing, this heart that just experiences like, God, thank you so much. When he thinks of these people and these people are his partners in ministry, he's saying it's just the saints in the church and emphasis, it's the church people, but he's saying, these are my ministry partners. And every time I think of them, I just thank God so much for who they are. And I love that because, you know, suffering is, it, it, it makes us feel unthankful, doesn't it? Suffering makes us like grow grumbly. It makes us complain. It, it makes us see everything that's wrong around us. And it's not hard to see things that are going wrong right now. And yet in the midst of that, Paul is saying, I am giving thanks regularly uh, for you. 
And so what is he thankful for? This is so huge. Sometimes what we're thankful for is, is um, you know, the high paying job we have, the status we receive, how well things are going, how easily, how easily life is going with our families and everything else. Those are the circumstantial things that we can be thankful for. But Paul's saying, I am so thankful for you, right? It's people. He's looking at the people that God has placed in his life and he's just saying, I'm so thankful for these people. God, thank you so much for them. Because that doesn't change, right? We, we, we have these people around us still. And of course, we have to use Zoom and FaceTime and telephone calls to stay in touch now. But these people still exist and they're around us and we can be thankful. And I will say that I, I am just so thankful for my church family. It has been so good for my soul. It has carried me through. And so he's, he's encouraging them. He's pushing them to Thanksgiving. He's talking about them being saints. In this encouragement that he's offering them, it's important to see encouragement is not just flattery. I think sometimes like those of us that are encouraging, like I'm a pretty encouraging person. Some of us are accused, I think, of being just like optimistic and just, oh, we'll just say anything positive. Encouragement isn't flattery. It's not baseless. Um, it's actually based in reality, but it's based in these truths that we've kind of lost sight of at the time. And so here's Paul encouraging them, not just groundlessly flattering them, but saying, I thank God for you because here's something that's true of you that you might not be seeing in the midst of your suffering. You are partners with me in this gospel. You are saints of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have experienced the good news of the gospel. And he just offers this and is so huge. It's so big. It's so profoundly real. Cultivating thankfulness in our life is huge when we're in suffering. It doesn't look like cultivating, um, you know, plenty. It doesn't look like cultivating like everything going well in our lives, prosperity. It, it just looks like looking at what the things God's given us and just saying, thank you so much, Lord. And that's the spiritual blessings. I mean, read any page of scripture and you'll have so many things to just tell God, thank you so much for what you've given me. But it also looks like looking at the people that are around you, thinking just face by face, name by name, and just saying, thank you, God, for fulfilling my life with these people. There's so much to be thankful for. It's interesting that in the midst of this, Paul talks about them as partners in the gospel. And, and, you know, going back to the intro, what he said is he's writing to the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons. I, I love this because, okay, Paul's not an apostle in this. He's just writing to them as a servant of Jesus. And he's writing to the church with the elders and overseers, not the ones who are over them, not the ones who are leading and, you know, just like top down kind of a thing, but it's the church along with them. They're part of it too, Right. It's important. And he's writing to these everyday people and saying, you are my partners in the gospel. And what I want to do is just share with you a couple of stories from people in our church. I'm hearing all the time, there's so many partners in the gospel. This is who we are as a church. We are not just a staff and a group of elders that does the ministry and you all are blessed by it, right? We are working side by side, partners for the ministry. And so I just want you to hear these couple of stories that I think are representative of some of the things I've been hearing overall in our church body and to, to just highlight this reality that we are partners in the gospel. Hey, Creekside. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Regina Perry, and my husband Jeff and I and our kids have been attending Creekside now for close to 13 years. Um, Our gospel community has been praying about ways that we can help people out and live as the church during these times. One opportunity that we have had most recently is to come alongside one of our gospel community members and help out three of her employees. She's a manager for a restaurant and she had been uh, helping out some of these employees with meals. So we decided we wanted to come alongside her and help her out and our gospel community pulled together a list of supplies and we were actually able to put together multiple meals for those families. So recently the Lord uh, spoke to me and um, it was a nice conversation. And uh, in the end, it made me feel so encouraged. He started off with a question. He said, if you get an opportunity to do something nice, for me, would you take that opportunity? And I got the thinking, I think that we'll all jump at that opportunity. Um, So the thing is, he does provide us with those opportunities. Um, 
It's everywhere. Even or especially in this time of isolation. And we, you know, I have seen you guys do it. Um, recently, it brought me great joy when, um, when Parker was showing me um, all the letters and cards he received from you guys. He had the biggest smile on his face and um, it was uplifting. It was encouraging uh, to see how much we can uh, make somebody's day and not make them feel alone and um, make them feel ministered to. Um, so it was just a nice reminder from the Lord that um, it's not so much as what we do for Him. Um, what it boils down to, it, um, it's the things that we do to Him. The, the people that's receiving our kindness, um, it means so much more to know that it's actually the Lord that we're doing it to. So, we're all ministers and we're just extensions of God's love. Um, the work that we do, it's, it's, it's His work. It's just flowing through us. I love hearing stories like this. And I maybe I get to hear them more than some of you do. And so I'm wanting to share this with you. But these are just a couple of examples of the kinds of things I keep hearing from so many of you. Just finding any opportunity to just serve people. And it's, it's not about any of us being great, right? It's not any of us saying, I'm capable. Lord, I can do it all. Just put me in the game. It's just about us being open and willing when we see a need and we find that the Lord has empowered us to do it. We just do it. Not as, not as these amazing people, but just as followers of Jesus who want to love like Jesus did. I like this because, okay, Paul's talking about this idea of partnership in the gospel. In the midst of the suffering setting, the partners in the gospel, here's what it makes me think of. I played, when I was in high school, I played football. And we would play, every team we played against had like 30 plus players. And, you know, they had first string, second string, third string. And so you had your kind of main players that would play and they're the best ones. So you hope that they can play the whole game. But in case one of them gets injured or tired, you have second string that can go in if need be. And maybe every now and then you'd send a third string player in. Well, I went to a tiny Christian school. And so we had 13 people and we played 11 man football. You know, there's 11 people on the field at any time. We only had a couple of people on the sidelines. So we did everything. I mean, it was like offense, defense, every special team. Like there was not a time that we stepped off of the field. We were all in, all in the game, all the time, all playing. And I feel like sometimes we make the church feel like a first string, second string, third string kind of a deal where there's staff, there's elders, you know, there's people like Paul who are doing the ministry and the rest of us are just being blessed by it. Actually, the, the church is more like us playing 11-man football with 13 players, right? It's We're 11 players. It's just us in the game. Like, we are all in the game. And there's something about this season now of isolation where um, it, it has robbed us of the illusion that the staff, the ministry staff, the pastors do the ministry. Because honestly, it has never actually been true. Uh, there's things we try to do to organize everybody and to empower people and to send each of us out and, and help us to get on board with this mission. But honestly, the real work always comes through relationships. It always comes from somebody just doing the little thing that they can. And, and anything that a, a church staff person can see that's big enough to get everybody on board with, um, it just lacks some of that relational feel. And so right now, in the midst of a pandemic, here we are, and we're all in the game, right? We're either in the game or we're not. And that means the church is either in the game or it's not because the church staff can't do it anymore. Um, we're all isolated, just like you. Well, I'll, the only people I am in contact with are my neighbors who I'm trying to dodge social distance wise and talk to from a distance or whatever. Those are the people I'm seeing and it's exactly the same with you. And so here we are, partners in the gospel. The gospel will go forth in our area. There is suffering all around us, and the gospel will do something about that suffering, but only if we ourselves are in the game, if we're in the midst of it. And so I see Paul just thanking God every time he remembers his partners in the gospel. And it just makes me think, you know, I'm just, I'm just 
see these stories and I'm thinking, God, thank you so much for Regina Perry, for her partnership with the gospel. She's in there. She's working. God, thank you so much for Ray Tan. Thank you that you're just using him in ways where he's just a simple servant offering himself to you. Thank you so much for Jose and Alicia Gutierrez. I just think down the line of just all of you and thinking, God, thank you so much. This partnership is so sweet and it's so good. And I know that in the midst of a season of suffering, you're going to just use us in whatever way you see. And the partnership, he says, okay, he thanks God for their partnership in the gospel from the first day till now. The partnership is in the gospel. So we don't have to wonder, what is it that we're called to do? What, what, what we celebrate, the gospel is not a tract, it's not a four-step thing. The gospel is good news. And it's good news that Jesus is who he is. And so our job is always to just soak in that reality That Paul throughout this letter is going to use the word gospel over and over again. Soak in the reality there is good news that there is a God in heaven. A God who is greater than any pandemic. A God who is greater than the sin in our lives. A God who is greater than all the opposition we face. This God is in heaven and this God loves us deeply. So deeply. And I'm saying us not as a church body in a big sense, but each of us as individuals. He loves us deeply made us to be the specific kind of person. And he acts in our lives all around us and in our hearts to show us, to remind us that he loves us. And by far the greatest act of love that anyone has ever shown anyone is Jesus himself coming to this earth, living amongst us as one of us, suffering in all the ways that we suffer, worse than we have ever suffered ourselves, and offering himself for us on our behalf, dying being tortured, being punished, being crucified and killed, being put into a grave for us because he loves us and because he wanted to set us free from the sin that we just entangle ourselves with, that pulls us down, that weights it. We're experiencing the suffering that we're in now, but remember there's all of this baggage we bring in our hearts into the suffering with us. And Jesus wants to free us of all of that, to let go of it. And so he died on our behalf And he rose again in new life saying that death no longer has a hold on us. Death no longer needs to terrify us in the midst of any suffering, anything that we face. We don't need to be afraid. We don't need to be dragged back into the sin, the doubt, the isolation. We are united with him in giving life. And I'm telling you, that is good news. And if it doesn't feel like good news, it's because we haven't been looking at it hard enough or it's been a long time since we looked deeply at the gospel. And so think about who Jesus is. Think about what he's done in, in, in your life. And then look at the friends, neighbors, coworkers around you and just say, I know something that is so good, something that is so life-changing, and I want to offer it in any way that I can, in any opportunity that I get, in small ways. It's not a sales pitch. It's not a persuasive, um, manipulative thing. It's just seeing this good news that we're so thrilled about that is deeper than any suffering we're experiencing. And it's stepping into that in the midst of this and offering them, offering the people that we experience as we offer it to ourselves, the good news that Jesus is better than anything we're experiencing. And so in this, Paul says, there is partners in verse six, this beautiful verse. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And here's the thing. <laughs> in the midst of all this, right? We feel like our lives are on hold. How many dreams and desires do we have for our lives that we just can't do right now? And yet here's this beautiful reminder. In the midst of suffering, in the midst of everything seeming like it's on hold, this promise from God saying that he will bring this good work. He started a good work in us and he will bring it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So they've been Paul's partners in the gospel from the first day till now and Jesus will continue this good work until the day of Christ Jesus. God is still at work. Our lives feel like they're on hold, but God is still working. And honestly, this whole pandemic thing is part of that. And I'm not trying to make some big statement about how, you know, God's trying to punish people or anything like that. we, We don't know what God does through a pandemic like this. But what I can say for sure is that God is at work in the midst of this. And I see him refining. I, I see in my own household, you know, I, we, there's tensions high sometimes as we're trying to figure out what it even looks like to homeschool our girls. And it's great sometimes. And it's so frustrating other times. And what's happening is we're just having all these hard issues boil to the surface. We're just stepping on each other's toes all the time. We're bumping into each other and we're always around and we're having to force our kids to do school because there's no teachers to do that. And it's so frustrating. But every time one of these comes up, I know, you know what? That's an issue in our hearts. My heart, 
my daughter's hearts, my wife's heart, that needs to be addressed, right? It needs to be brought to the light and offered up to God so that he can transform and change it. And, and just because it hasn't been popping up until now doesn't mean that the coronavirus caused it. It's there in our hearts and the situation brings it to the surface. And here we are. This, this whole thing, God's going to, he started a good work. He's going to complete it. He's using the coronavirus to, to purify my family of some things that are there. I'm assuming it's the same thing with yours too. There's an opportunity in all this always to draw closer to Jesus, to see, okay, he's not, he's not working. He, he's not stopped working. He is working. And, and, and regardless of the desires we have for our lives, God has a desire to transform us and to work in us. And so for watching, we'll see that he's going to do that in us, even in the midst of this whole thing. It's beautiful the way that God works. So finally, he says in verse seven, it is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you were all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. I love it because Paul is just saying, look, in the midst of this whole thing, I'm here in chains and you're partakers with me of grace. We're all experiencing God's grace. He's calling them to joy. Like throughout this letter, he's just going to come back to joy, joy, joy. We have to remember that joy, again, is not the result of our circumstances. Joy is actually a fruit of the spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. These things are fruits of the spirit. That means it's fruit that the spirit of God produces in our life. So if it comes from the spirit, it never actually came from our circumstances, we thought that there was joy in the jobs that we had and the status that we had and the way we were able to enjoy our freedoms and all this kind of stuff. But really, the only true joy we ever had was a fr- the fruit of the Spirit of God working in our lives. And Paul's going to remind us of that throughout this letter, that we can be suffering, but, but here we are, and, and we can experience joy in the midst of that. So what I want to do, I want us to all process this in whatever way. If you get a chance to Zoom with a group of people, that's fantastic. Um, I I would love for all of us to be processing this in our gospel communities. If you're by yourself right now as you're watching this, I would love for you not to waste this chance to process some of it. Sometimes we make it uh, theoretical and intellectual. What I want to encourage you to do is not just talk about these following three things, but to actually do them, to actually experience them right now. And, And the three things are this, be thankful, partner for the gospel, and pursue joy. These are the three things. So if talking about you, talking about these things will help you put them into practice, then do that. But there's nothing stopping you right now from cultivating thankfulness in your heart. So if you're with your gospel community group, talk about that. Be thankful together, right? Don't just talk about what it means to be thankful, but let's be thankful right now and talk about all the people and all the beautiful gifts that God has given us, even in the midst of this crazy crisis. Um, the second thing, let's talk about what it means to be partners in the gospel. So, so if, if, if discussing that with a group is going to be helpful to you, then do it. Discuss what does it mean to partner? How can I help you? How can I work together with you? But let's not stop at a discussion. It might not even need to start as a discussion. Let's just partner for the gospel. Let's just find opportunities. Let's look and think, what does God bring into my mind when I think, what does it mean to be a partner with the gospel right now? Let's just do it. And then pursuing joy. Joy is not easy. It, it's not easy to find. But I know because Paul wrote Philippians that joy is possible. It can be found in the midst of our suffering. And so if talking about being joyful will help you be joyful, then do it. That's huge. We're here for each other. But be joyful right now. Pursue joy right now. It it might start with just asking God, Lord, things have been so hard. I feel so wrecked. I feel so lost. Please provide me with joy. Somehow show me joy. Do that. Think about the things of Jesus. Think about the good news that he offers us. But let's be joyful right now. So thankfulness, partnership in the gospel, joy. Let's pursue these things. I love you guys so much. I cannot wait to be physically with you, but I know that right now God is working. He's doing something big. I don't know what's next for us, but I know that God is working in the midst of us and he has something huge in store for us next.